Olsey's presentation and now the upcoming presentation that uh, many of us have been super excited and waiting for as well is coming from uh, Dr. Ken Highland from the University of East um, Anglia. Anglia? Yes. All right. So just a little bit of, uh, of a bio from uh, Dr. Highland. Uh, Dr. Highland is the honorary professor uh, at the University of East Anglia. I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit about it. Um, he was previously a professor at the University of College London, at the UEA and the University of Hong Kong. He's best known for his research into academic uh, discourse and writing, having published a mere 280 articles and 29 books on these topics with over 69,000 citations on Google Scholar, if you can wrap your arms around that one. A collection of his work was published as The Essential Highland uh, in 2018 by Bloomsbury Press. He's the editor of two book series with Bloomsbury and Rutledge mm. and founding uh, co-editor of the Journal of English for Academic Purposes and co-editor of Applied Linguistics. And his topic today is Teaching ESL Writing Three Perspectives. We're so excited to have you with us, Dr. Highland, and uh, I'll turn the program over to you. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, great, off I go. Uh, thanks, Leslie, for the introduction. Thanks to Melissa for inviting me, and thanks to everyone for, to, uh, for coming to my talk. Um, okay. Uh, I've got a... This is a, a, a public health warning, first of all. My talk is very different to the last one, okay? I'm not such an engaging speaker as Deb, and um, the content is, is gonna be very different. I'm, I'm not going to give you advice on what to, you might, the ways you might teach. I'm gonna kind of give you some um, options um, that you might reflect on and see how they might work out in your own, um, your own context. Okay, let's... Uh, oh, I've got to share the screen and um, okay, have you got that? Yes. yes. Okay, right. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, I want to talk about um, um, teaching writing, um, partly because it's one of the few things I know anything about, but also because I think it's one of the most difficult skills for students to acquire and perhaps the most difficult for teachers to teach. Um, one reason for this difficulty is that before we sit down to write, we've got to have at least some knowledge of five things. So we need content knowledge. What are we going to write about? Uh, system knowledge, how to put this together. Um, in the UK, it's called SPAG, Spelling, Punctuation and Grammar. We need process knowledge, how to um, uh, construct a text through drafts and revisions. Genre knowledge, how the content is organized as a message and reader knowledge. So how to anticipate uh, the reader's attitude and what they need to, to know. Now, all of these things I think are important. Um, and perhaps we need to see expertise at the intersection of at least three of them. Okay, so as I say, I'm gonna talk about um, three key approaches to um, uh, writing, which I, I see as options really, although there's overlap and you can mix and match, um, but, but I'd like you to reflect and see if they might be appropriate in your own situation. Okay, so each focus assumes a different idea about what writing is. So the first concentrates on uh, the products of writing by uh, looking at text. The second focuses on uh, the writer and the processes used to create text. And the third approach emphasizes the role that readers play in writing, showing how writers uh, think about um, an audience in creating text. As I say, this is a very broad approach, but I think it's a useful way of um, of, of, of kind of understanding where um, our ideas about writing have come from and how these feed into teaching practices. 
Okay, first of all, um, text-oriented uh, research. Um, these see writing as an outcome, um, the words on a page or on a screen. Uh, so this is writing as a noun, not a verb. <clears throat> and there are two ways we can look at uh, texts as uh, a text, because we can see them either as objects or as discourse. Seeing texts as objects really means understanding writing as the application of rules. So writing is a thing. It's independent of any particular writer, reader or context. And learning to become a good writer is largely a matter of knowing grammar. So this is what we often call a, a product approach. So this sees writing um, as the arrangement of words clauses and sentences and students can be taught to say exactly what they mean by putting them all together in the right order in the writing classroom what this often means um, is an emphasis on on language structures often like this there's some kind of familiarization where learners study a text to get an idea of its vocabulary and and grammar um, there's a controlled writing where they manipulate fixed patterns, often um, using um, substitution tables. Then there's some kind of guided writing, filling in blanks, completing uh, paragraphs and so on. And then there's a free writing where they get to actually use the patterns they've developed to write an essay, a letter or whatever. Now, this has been um, a, a dominant classroom approach for many years across the world, but it draws on the rather old fashioned and discredited idea that we transfer ideas from one mind to another using language. And this lies behind the conduit metaphor, which you might have come across um, before. Now, this says basically um, that the lady with the fair hair has an idea. She puts this into the box, into words, sends it through the conduit, which is writing. The lady with the dark hair receives the words and magic. She gets the same idea as was intended by the, um, the blonde lady. <clears throat> so um, meanings correspond with words and writing reflects meanings rather than creating them. So meanings can be written down and understood by anyone with the right encoding and decoding skills. A text says everything that needs to be said. There are no conflicts of interpretation, no reader positions, no different understandings. We all see things in the same way and life is wonderful. But this doesn't make sense, of course, because accuracy is only one feature of good writing. And on its own, it doesn't, it doesn't make communication. This is how lawyers make their money. They, um, they dispute and pick apart the most detailed written contracts and documents. And there's always more than one interpretation. So our goal as writing teachers can never be just training students in accuracy, because all texts include what writers assume the readers will know and how they're going to use the text. The writer's problem is not to make everything explicit uh, through words, that's impossible, but to make it explicit enough for particular readers, balancing what, uh, what needs to be said against what can be assumed. So then, to summarise, this, this model really views text as forms, which can be understood independently of users, and if we adopt it as a teaching approach, we run the risk of misleading students into thinking, you know, you just got to put the words in the right order and, and uh, hey presto. A second way of looking at um, um, text sees them as discourse. So this is the way that we use language to communicate, to achieve purposes in specific situations. So here, the writer is seen as having certain goals and that the ways we write are resources to accomplish these goals. So instead of forms being independent of context, a discourse approach sees them um, as located in social actions. This is, this is how we get things done using language. And teachers 
look to identify the ways that texts work as communication, linking um, language forms to the uh, purposes and the context in which they're used. Of course, a key idea here is genre. And this is just basically a term for grouping text together. So we know immediately, for example, um, whether a text is a recipe, a joke, or a love letter. And we can often um, respond to it or perhaps even write one of our own if we need to. We all have a, a repertoire of these responses that we can call up to communicate in familiar situations. And we learn new ones as we as we need them. So teachers get good at things like um, lesson plans, uh, classroom tests, and so on. These new genres that we learn. Now, genre reminds us that when we write, we follow conventions for organising messages because we want our reader to recognise our purpose. What are we trying to do? And this is like the the introduction, body, conclusion. Uh, pattern that we learn to write our essays in school, or the problem solution pattern, which organizes narratives. Now, a lot of stories from fairy stories to Dostoevsky are written around um, uh, uh, this model. So the text usually opens with a contextualizing move, which introduces the players, then a problem is introduced for the participants, followed by their response to the um, problem. And finally, there's an evaluation of the response. Was it successful? And, and we, we, as I say, we see this in a lot of stories. So genre approaches then describe the stages which help writers uh, set out their thoughts in ways that we can, that readers can easily follow. So all genres have a social purpose. They're, they're trying to get something done for the writer. Um, and the main goal of a narrative, of course, is to, is to entertain through storytelling. This is achieved, as I've shown, through these fairly conventional steps. Um, Jim Martin calls genre staged, goal-oriented activity. Um, we can't achieve our goal all in one jump, so we work towards it in stages. Two examples of this um, I want to quickly share are um, the explanation and instruction genres. So an explanation is a text which um, describes a process like the water cycle or how something works, like a light bulb. Um, this example is written by a primary school student in the UK. Um, and um, it, it, it shows the structure of a simple explanation, a general statement introducing the topic and then a series of logical steps explaining how or why something occurs. Genre doesn't only tell us about the structure, it also tells us about what features we might find in a text. So in explanations, we're likely to see generalized non-human participants. It's uh, often used as the, the timeless present. A lot of temporal connectors, causal connectors, and a lot of um, action verbs. Things happen, people do things. Instructions are different. These describe um, how something should be done. So they usually consist of a statement of what's to be achieved, the goal, a list of materials and equipment needed, a series of sequence steps to achieve the goal, and then finally um, a, a, a coda where uh, um, it shows you what you've done. Now, oh, by the way, this is this is not an authentic text. Um, I made it up, and I can't bake, and so don't make notes on this. You, uh, these muffins will poison you. Um, but you can see the structure there. And the main features are that they're written in chronological order, they're very direct, simple present or imperative um, sentences, they focus on generalized human groups, not individuals usually, short, simple sentences, a lot of signposts indicating the sequence, and again, uh, action verbs. So genres encourage us to look for 
look for patterns, look for repeated uses of language to see how we typically create meanings. Now, what does this mean in the classroom? Well, it, for one thing, it means attending to grammar, but this isn't the old traditional grammar of the writing as object approach. Here, grammar is a resource for um, producing text. So um, a knowledge of grammar, the argument goes, shifts writing from the implicit and hidden, something that, that, that we don't know, to the explicit and conscious, something that we can use to write effectively. Now in class, this often involves um, consciousness raising. Um, getting students to notice, reflect on, and then use uh, writing uh, conventions to help them produce well-formed and valued texts. One approach widely used in Australia is the teaching learning cycle. And I know the next speaker um, in this series is, is going to be talking about this, so I'll, I'm just going to be very brief. Um, uh, to introduce it in case you haven't come across this before. The cycle really helps us to plan classroom activities by seeing genre learning as a series of linked um, stages which support learners towards understanding texts. The key stages are, first of all, un understanding the purpose of the genre and the settings where it's used. So how does it fit into social, academic, professional um, uh, situations? Who writes it? Who with? Who for? What's the relationship between the writer and the reader? Um, so we look at a text to see what writers are trying to do with it. The second stage um, involves modeling the genre, analyzing it, looking at its stages and key features. So what are the main um, uh, themes or tenses? What kind of vocabulary does it use? So here teachers might get students to um, sequence or label text stages, reorganize scrambled paragraphs, uh, write unfinished ones and so on. The third stage involves the joint construction of the genre through um, guided teacher supported practice so maybe students write a parallel text um, the story of cinderella from the perspective of the of the evil sisters for example or they work in small groups to create a text the fourth step is independent writing here students are um, working alone monitored by the teacher finally the teacher pulls all this together uh, uh, highlighting what's been learned by linking this genre to um, other genres the students might know or other genres in the same context. So they can learn more through comparison. So each stage of the cycle has a different purpose and draws on different classroom activities. The cycle also provides scaffolded learning for students. Um, it supports them through what Vygotsky calls the zone of proximal development, which is a, a, a fancy term for basically the gap between what the students can do now and what they can do after instruction. And this is a key element of this is the teacher support. But also, as we move around the cycle, the um, direct teacher instruction and intervention is reduced. Students gradually um, gain more confidence and more competence in writing the genre of their own, on their own. So they gain uh, control as we move down uh, through the uh, stages to independent construction where there's very little support from the teacher and a great deal of control from uh, the student. Okay, um, life is never um, perfect, is it? And um, genre teaching has been criticized um, for stifling creativity by imposing models on students. And obviously there are risks here. Um, teachers might teach genres as a recipe so that students get the idea they just have to pour their own meanings into the, uh, into the genre mold. 
uh, to make sense. But there's no reason why providing students with um, an understanding of discourse is any more prescriptive than, say, providing them with a description of the clause or uh, a description of the, the, the steps in the writing process. Um, the key point is that, that genres do constrain us. There's, there's no question about it. As soon as we decide that we're going to write an engineering report, um, a, 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 an informal email or an essay, then we're going to write within certain expectations. The genre doesn't dictate uh, that we write in a certain way, um, nor does it determine what we write, of course. It enables choices to be made because meaning comes from choosing some options and not others. It's, it's the reader seeing these choices as choices that um, helps them make sense of what we're trying to do. The genre theories, uh, theorists suggest that a teacher who understands how texts are typically structured in this way um, and how they're used is in a better position to intervene successfully in the writing development of his or her students. Okay, so the second broad approach focuses on the writer rather than on the text. So interest here is on what good writers do when they write so that these, uh, these processes, these practices can be uh, taught to second language students. <clears throat> So here, writing is seen as a process through which writers discover and reformulate their ideas as they attempt to create meanings. So it's more of a problem solving activity than an act of communication. Um, how people approach writing a writing task and solve it as a problem. How do I express myself? So to explain how writers uh, solve this problem, process um, theorists draw on the tools of cognitive psychologists and artificial intelligence. In this model, there's a memory, central processing unit, uh, problem solving programs and flowcharts. And I'm sure every teacher here has seen uh, a flowchart, something like this. Um, it's well known, but it shows that writers don't create texts by thinking, writing, editing but they jump between the different stages. And the flow chart then gives us a lot of information. It, 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 for example, it tells us that writers have goals and that they plan extensively, often through internet searches, note taking and so on. It tells us that writing is constantly revised, often in our heads um, and often before any text is, uh, has been produced at all. It says that planning, drafting, revising and editing are recursive, they happen again and again, and they're potentially simultaneous, and that plans and texts are constantly evaluated by the writer in a, in a feedback loop of plan, write, plan, write. So the model then advises, it's got a lot of advice for teachers, um, and it, uh, it says we should assist writing through these different uh, stages. So it encourages teachers to give pre-writing activities. So um, brainstorming and outlining are very important in this approach uh, to generate ideas. Um, uh, teachers are encouraged to allow students to write several drafts, um, improving each one as they go. That giving feedback on drafts and revising, encouraging peer review, um, of the writing is, is, um, is very important. Delaying surface corrections until the final editing is, is often um, invoked. And uh, finally, publishing the work. How is it going to be shared with others as a, a poster, um, class website, or whatever? Now, this has been, um, you know, I'm sure everyone here is, 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 is knows this model um, because it's been very dominant in the US for, for years. But um, I think from my point of view, I think students need language support, not just writing support in order to overcome their problems. The influence of cognitive psychology here, rather than applied linguistics, means that teachers are concerned with what 
what the writer thinks about when they write and not the language that they need to do it. And for me, this creates four main problems. First of all, by overemphasizing psychological factors, it neglects the importance of how context influences writing. So process focuses on the writer as an isolated individual struggling to express personal meanings. So it tends to represent writing as a decontextualized skill. There's little understanding here of the ways that language is used in particular domains or what it means to communicate with other people in particular situations. But in fact, we very rarely just write. We always write for a purpose uh, in a particular situation. And this involves variation in the ways that we use language, not universal rules. So in other words, process models don't really give us any help in understanding language, nor do they allow us to confidently advise our students on the kind of language that they need to write a particular kind of text. Second, this is a discovery based approach, which doesn't really make the language that students need explicit. Students are not taught the structures of target text types, but are expected to discover appropriate forms in the process of writing itself or through the teacher's commentary in the, in the margins of their drafts. Now, this might be OK for well-educated L1 students, um, but second language students find themselves in what Amy Delpit calls an invisible curriculum. And this is rather a long quote, but I think it's, it's worth um, reading. And she says that adherence to process approaches to writing create situations in which students ultimately find themselves held accountable for knowing a set of rules about which no one has ever directly informed them. Teachers do students no service to suggest even implicitly that product is not important. Students will be judged on their product regardless of the process that they use to achieve it. And that product, based as it is on the specific codes of a particular culture, is more readily produced when the directives of how to produce it are made explicit. So a third problem, I think, is that um, the model, the process model assumes that making the processes of expert writers explicit will make them uh, novices into better writers. But not all writing is the same, of course. It doesn't always depend on the ability to use universal context independent revision and editing strategies. Exam writing, for example, doesn't involve multi-draft and, and revision. And a, a lot of academic and professional writing is often collaborative and time constrained. So different kinds of writing involve different processes. Finally, um, and you, you're not gonna like this, um, but I think that process models disempower teachers. Um, this is a model of learning based on personal freedom, self-expression, learner responsibility. And all of this might be stifled by too much teacher intervention. And I think to, to some extent, this reduces teachers to well-meaning bystanders who um, assign a task and then give feedback on it. Because language and text organization are added on to the end of the process as editing, rather than are seen as a central resource for actually creating the text, Students are given no way of seeing how uh, different texts are written for particular purposes and audiences. So this is um, Chris Tribble there taking a selfie. Um, and he says, while a process approach will certainly make it possible for apprentice writers to become uh, more effective at generating texts, and I think process does that very well, this may be to little avail if they're not aware of what their readers expect to find in those texts. So mentioning readers there brings us on to the third um, uh, approach to writing that I want to talk about. Um, now, while a, a, a writer-oriented research I've been talking about sees context as the site of writing, what the where the writer is, what he or she is thinking about, and so on, a final approach, this final approach expands the idea of context beyond 
the local writing situation to the reader's context, how writers think their text will be understood and what they do to express the reader. So who is the writer writing for? What's the relationship, formal, informal? Is there a power difference, friendly or stranger? Does, what does the reader know, an expert or a beginner? Maybe more than you or less than you? What does he or she believe? Will she understand your text? Will she agree with your ideas? And all of these things will influence, of course, how the text is constructed. So when we write, we choose our words to connect with others, to present our ideas in ways which make most sense to them. So we try and we try and draw readers in to influence them, persuade them, inform them, entertain them in a, by a text that sees the world in a similar way to them. And we do this by using the words, structures and kinds of um, argument that they're likely to accept and understand. So a reader oriented view um, emphasizes the interaction between writers and readers. And here, process means something different. The process of writing involves creating a text that the writer assumes the reader will recognize and expect. And the process of reading involves drawing on assumptions about what the writer is trying to do. So this is called coherence in linguistics. And Mike Hoey says this is like dancers following each other's steps. It's not you know, rave dancing, but ballroom dancing where here each um, participant is building sense from a text by anticipating what the other person is trying to do. Now it's the unfamiliarity of these expectations that, that is one reason uh, that writing is in English is so difficult for second language um, speakers because what's seen as logical, engaging, relevant, well organized in writing, what counts as evidence, humor, conciseness, coherence differs across cultures. Now, culture isn't the only explanation, of course. We can't just read off um, the ways that students write according to a culture. But it's clear there are different ways of organizing ideas and structuring arguments um, in different languages. Research suggests, for example, um, that compared with many languages, academic texts in English are very different from other languages. And I'm sorry I'm going into EAP here, but this is my, my background. But um, academic um, texts in English tend to be more explicit about their structure and the purpose. So we're often saying what we're going to do, then we say it, and then we said what, say what we've said. Yeah. Um, it employs more and more recent citations, it uses fewer rhetorical questions, it focuses on actions rather than actors, it's less tolerant of digressions than many languages, it's more cautious in making claims so that it has a lot of hedges, it has stricter conventions for subsections and labelling subsections, and it uses more sentence connectors such as therefore, however, and so on. So because of this, English teachers in universities tend to spend a lot of time focusing on the ways which help students to do this. So they teach nominalization, impersonalization, connectives, hedging, meta discourse, and so on. Now, Michael Klein once argued that um, we can trace these differences to the fact that English makes the writer responsible for clarity. So in some traditions of writing, um, I understand German, uh, Korean, Finnish, Chinese, Japanese, it's the reader who is expected to dig out the meaning of a text from a dense and difficult text. In English, it's the writer who, um, so in, in that, in, in, in that um, tradition, the, the, the writer complements the reader on their ability to understand the text. In English, um, the, the, the reader has to spell everything out. Now, considering readers means looking at the ways that writing 
is used by social groups because that's you know we we sometimes uh communicate with with um with large groups but we don't tend to communicate with the English speaking world at large, um, but we're with members of particular groups, whether these are friends, workplace, family, um, ac academic disciplines, professions or whatever. And because of this, the concept of discourse community is important as a way of joining writers, texts and readers together. Now, discourse community is a fuzzy um, idea. It's defined in different ways. So the great John Soyles sees uh, com discourse communities as having collective goals, while other writers like Anne Johns uh, have suggested that they've common interests rather than goals. David Barton's definition is even looser, and he uh, uh, argues that a discourse community is just basically a group of people who have texts and practices in common, however they're using it as readers of, of writers, um, or who the text is aimed at or so on. So um, it's people who participate in a set of discourse practices, both by reading and writing. Now, so while there are um, problems with the idea of discourse community, it does help to show us something about how writing works in different workplaces, classes, disciplines, and so on. It tells us, for example, that needs analysis is important um, when we're teaching writing. If we can identify the students' needs, um, it's, it's a great uh, shortcut to uh, what they might uh, need to learn. But um, this tells us, for example, that um, different disciplines value different kinds of argument and set different writing tasks. So in the humanities and social sciences, analyzing and synthesizing from different sources is important. Well, that's less important in science and technology, which values activity-based skills like describing procedures, uh, defining objects and planning solutions. At the most obvious level of community difference is, of course, Lexis. And this slide shows um, a bit of a quick and dirty um, analysis of chapters from five um, first year introductory course university course books in applied linguistics and biology. And these are the most frequent content words in those chapters. And um, we can see that um, there's very there's no overlap. The disciplines have completely different ways of talking about the world and students need to learn completely different vocabularies. Less obviously, a corpus study uh, that Polite and I did a few years ago of four million words shows that um, Avril Coxhead's so-called universal um, academic word lists the items on that actually have very different frequencies and preferred meanings in different fields. So consist means stay the same in the social sciences and composed of in the sciences. Volume means book in applied linguistics and quantity in biology. Abstract means remove in engineering and theoretical in the social sciences. Okay, then these are kind of obvious things, but the point is that um, what looks the same might be false friends in different contexts. Another example of this is Althea Ha's um, PhD study of six million words from economics and finance, where she found 837 words which had a meaning specific to those fields, although most of them had a, a, a different general meaning as well. So words that we use every day, asset, risk, interest, income, means something uh, quite different um, in this um, uh, um, professional academic context. We also know that different fields make use of different genres. So in their large scale study, a corpus study of 30 disciplines in UK universities, Nessie and Gardner found 13 different genre families, ranging from narratives through case studies, empathy writing, problem questions, reports, and so on. And these genres differ considerably um, 
in their social purpose, in their, their organizational structure, and in the networks that they form with other genres. So I think we need to be clear about what it is our students need from uh, uh, writing classes. And it, it gets even more complicated because even in related fields, like um, students write very different texts. So Jimenez, for example, looked at the assignments given to medical uh, students, and he found that students in nursing and midwifery were given very, very different texts. There's no overlap there um, at all. So I think, you know, these kinds of understandings help us to focus on the typical genres that um, that disciplines require and that, that our students might need so that we can focus on on their uh, uh, needs. Now, a reader oriented approach suggests that instead of basing teaching on our impressions of writing, we need to study text carefully and help students to see how different genres work uh, with different readers. And as I mentioned before, this is really um, the idea of consciousness racing. And basically the idea is, is to encourage students to reflect on their own writing, what it is they're trying to do and how they're doing it, and help them to see how language is actually used by helping them to see things in text. You know, um, we don't want to turn them into discourse analysts. They're probably not interested, but making things salient so they can see how language works in particular uh, kinds of genres. Now, there are various ways of, of doing this. Um, I just want to mention three to, to close. Um, these are mixed genre portfolios, comparative tasks, and audience analysis. Now, the, the, <clears throat> the great um, Anne Johns advocates using mixed genre portfolios. So basically, this is where students are asked to write a range of different genres, say an argument essay, a research-based assignment, a summary, a narrative. Then at the end of the semester, collect them all together in a folder for assessment with a commentary on each one. So basically, we use portfolios to get an accurate picture of, of students' writing, you know, what can they do? Um, and how can they vary their language? But it also helps students themselves to see the different ways that language, that genres are organized to achieve different purposes uh, for different readers in different contexts. So this is um, an example of um, a portfolio used in secondary schools in, um, in Singapore. And we can see that um, in red are the different genres that the students were asked to produce and the uh, kinds of questions, example questions that they were asked to comment on. So why did you organize the essay in this way? What parts of it did you like best? What difficulties did you have? Um, what did you learn from writing it? So, of course, they, they, these have a consciousness raising function by getting students to, to think about similarities and differences between genres. Um, second, we can give students comparative tasks. I'm very keen on comparative tasks. Uh, they're excellent devices for raising students' awareness of language features by um, showing how things change uh, with readers. Uh, so you can, um, comparisons can be made by looking at um, a particular genre in English uh, with the same genre in the student's L1, getting them to notice and reflect on similarities and differences about how something might be used. Um, they could compare the advice that they get in a language textbook uh, on a feature and, um, and good examples of a target text, perhaps looking at what does the textbook say about using I, for example. Uh, the I pronoun, and what do actual uh, texts tell us about it? Or compare um, how a feature um, varies across two genres, maybe the use of you pronouns or, or again, I pronouns or, or hedges across two genres. Finally, students can be asked to to study real readers, um, interviewing proficient uh, users of a genre about their writing. 
um, perhaps somebody else, somebody in a different department about their writing. This isn't always possible, of course, and more realistically, in many contexts, teachers can, um, can actually encourage students to think about who their readers are and what they need from a text. So this is a simple uh, checklist to help students sensitize, sensitize students to the importance of attending to shared knowledge. So this example is a response to a letter of complaint but it can be adapted for any kind of text. So quite simply, what do I know about the topic? What does my reader know? What does my reader not know? And what's my reader's attitude likely to be? Okay, so I'm, I'm wrapping up um, with my conclusion. So I've, I've really tried very briefly to cover the major frameworks that have been used to look at writing and at the same time uh, to argue that writing isn't just words on a page or on a screen, nor is it the activity of isolated individuals creating personal meanings. It's always a social practice. It's influenced by cultural and institutional contexts. Now, what this means for teachers um, is that we need, I think, as far as possible to become researchers of the texts our students will need and in the context in which they'll need them. So getting hold of what it is that they are expected to write. I mean, sometimes this is quite hard, but in a school context, um, it, 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 it should be um, easy enough to ask other subject teachers what, what they want to, what they're writing in English. And then after identifying these things is through our classroom, um, activities to make these features um, as explicit as we possibly can to our learners. Okay, thank you very much um, for your attention. I think we've got time for questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask, or you can ask the question in the chat. Silence. Um, I have to work on the code. <laughs> may I just say thank you so much for a great overview of what I'm going to be presenting next. <laughs> so that was awesome. I didn't want to steal your thunder. It was too late when I, you know, when I saw the program and your your abstract time. Mm. No, no, no. It will be, it will be, uh, it will be different because I'm going into actually applications in the classroom. So yeah. no, that's, and, that's and now correct. I can yeah. go, you know, over certain things that I was go, I was going to spend a little more time on more quickly. So I appreciate that. Get more more time for for grilling with questions. That's <laughs> at the end. I'll jump in. Hey, thank you very much. Hi, Keith Falls here in Florida. Yeah, hey, yeah, um, yeah. Hey, just no. Thank you very much. That that was you know I, I know the research you're talking about with the applied uh, the academic word list and how in the states. I mean, if we go back historically around late 1990s, nobody would use a list at all. Yeah. At a PSL conference when you would talk about using a list, this was oh verboten. Oh my gosh, your explicit teaching go away. Bad, bad. And then. They discovered the AWL, and that took a long time to take off. And when it took finally took off, you can't undo it now. Yeah. So, and when you talk about limitations it might have, yeah, you can sense a certain discomfort in the room. It, um, but but it's unfortunate that people feel that way. But we have so much better lists out there now, or, or not not better. We have so much more variety of lists that are better tailored to the kind of student that you teach. I yeah. think it's a better way to say it, right? But there something are a lot you said of, a lot I wanted... of very specific, very yes. specific list. I think the AWL is is still useful, you know. I, I but but it, it does make us very cautious about these so-called semi-technical items, you know, that yes. they're 
they're not as helpful as they, you know, not as generalizable as they might seem. Well, one thing I wanted to come in on that, that you, that uh, really hit home for me was you talked about how teachers should know more about what kind of writing their students are going to actually have to do down the road, right? Mm. So when I was doing some research several years back and we got uh, a small corporal reform with papers from freshman composition courses, English 101, for lack of a better word. And then we took pa papers that got an A or B. We only collected A or B papers because we didn't need the CDF because my yeah. students could already do that kind of stuff. So, and then we also got uh, history papers. And I hadn't been in a history course in 30, 40 plus years or more. And I was shocked to see the difference in what the assignments look like in a history class versus what writing assignments, versus what the writing assignments look like in a freshman comp class. The length was extremely different. People in the chat group were talking about citations a little bit, how you cited or didn't cite, how you were expected to cite or not cite was different. And the number of assignments, it was just, so Ken, it was just, I was shocked at, wow, even the number of assignments is, was, I don't wanna say universally, but two assignments in, in the history course and I don't know, 15 in the English course, right? Yeah. Very yeah. different. Yeah, and you know, I uh, I, I just, um, interviewed a lot of faculty um, uh, staff, and they, um, I mean, it, it it looks like English teachers are the only friends that the students have got when it comes to writing. You know, um, history teachers care about writing, but they, you know, they don't spend any time on it. And you know, in the sciences, forget about it. You know, if you if you can't write, then you know who cares. You know you you're 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 doomed. But the um, you know I I, I was interested in um, um, in Australia. You know the whole genre thing came out of of primary schools where they found that when 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 these kids, little kids, were given um, scientific subjects, um, you know like like. Uh, you know how to explain something they wrote it as a story because the story the narrative was the only thing they knew how to do um and so you know the the, the genre the australian genre people started saying well you know this is what um a, a, a science assignment looks like this is what um you know you need to do in this kind of class and history and geography and so on so that students had this repertoire this these ways of of, of making meanings that were more valued in, in those disciplines rather than, um, you know, just doing narratives that they that they were familiar with. So, um, yeah, and I, I think it's the same with vocabulary, isn't it? That, um, but how specific do you get? You know, that's that's the issue. Um, you know, do you do you look at um, you know do you narrow right down to you know economics vocabulary or um, a biology vocabulary um, and when do you do that at what stage you know um, it, and it's the same with the writing but um, in some ways it's easier for um, for for teachers at universities where students have made their commitment to a particular major you know in in in, in schools it could be a little bit more tricky yeah, I think it is. I think the, the hardest job, actually, I think, are the people who teach literature, English language arts in the K-12 setting. Because mm -hmm. if you're in terms of anticipating vocabulary your students might need, because if you're OK, if you're, it's a history course. You, or you're, that slide you had, was the one I took a, a shot of with that biology, I forget the biology I think you had, where the mm -hmm. words were like very different. I think one of the words yeah. was volume, for example. I, mean, yeah. I caught my eye. But um, in the in the K twelve setting, if you're the if you're the literature person or, or whatever that's called today, you, there's no way to anticipate the vocabulary yeah. that your students are going to read tomorrow. Is it is it a O Henry short story? Is it Shakespeare? It could be on any topic in the whole world. Yeah. So in that case, I think we just go back to basic vocab <laughs> adjectives that you might. Need. I don't know what you go back with. It's just a lot tougher, is it not? But yeah. when people see the AWL, I, I, I appreciate your work on pointing out some of the limitations of it and very, you know, not criticism, as you said, not the list is not bad. It just has limitations mm -hmm. and there are mm -hmm. other options out there. And I think yeah. that goes back to teachers knowing what your students want to do when they're going to go right. 
yeah yeah and I, I that's what I think I think um you know teacher professional development is so important isn't it I mean it's it's um it's about knowing the options it's mm -hmm. about being familiar with with what the possibilities are you know mm -hmm. I don't think um teachers necessarily need a laundry list of 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 um uh of, of classroom practices what they what they need is is a kind of um the uh the the, the, the skill set to, to to be able to to find what they need to analyze the text um even on a, a you know a, 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 a quick and dirty basis mm. because i think that is 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 very very helpful you know mm -hmm. to be able to zero in as far as possible on what it is the students need Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more question. Yes, I would like to um, invite Ken and Keith to be involved in teacher professional development. I used to, I've taught all over the map from K through 12. ESL in Pennsylvania. I taught eight years in Japan in conversation schools. I've taught in four universities in intensive English programs. I've come to the end of my career and I have this vast experience and knowledge from very different uh, experiences. So from refugees to students born in the United States who speak another language mm -hmm. to international students. And what we're missing in teacher professional development is researchers like you who have tended, not you in particular, but you, the, the, the trend has been for researchers to write for college students. And most of the ESL students, second language learners in the United States are refugees. Or, you know, for example, in a Puerto Rican family or another uh, languages who have been second or third generation, not speaking English is their first language in the United States. And so to have a real impact on the field, now that you are at the, the end stage of your career, I invite you please to make quick and dirty or slightly more developed professional development videos or other materials or classes so you can have an on a real impact in the United States in lifting the level of language of millions of students. And it will be an impact indirectly to encourage other students who are monolingual English speakers to see that bilingualism is really a possibility. Mm -hmm. So it's an invitation to you and to other of your colleagues who may be interested in that because it's a, the work you have done is wonderful, but it doesn't get to the vast majority of people who need it, unfortunately. And people like me who are too busy picking up spitballs and, you know, and talking to parents through, through five or six different interpreters don't have time to do that. I wish I did. But I don't. And I, um, I can't no, th th thanks for your comment. I, th I think that you make an important point there that, um, you know, I've been talking about variations in in genres and language use and, you know, and, and Keith's been talking about variations in vocabulary. But we, um, you know, at the bottom of it uh, or at the heart of it is variations in, in students and the, the diversity of uh, bilingual students now that we're asked to teach is extraordinary and yes. that is um that really is is a is a guide to you know perhaps what we should be teaching what it what is it that these particular refugees need what is it that that um you know second year biologists need you know what is it that that primary students need you know i and and it's only the teachers that are um that are working with and are engaged um in that context that that, that can provide the best answers there yes but we are too busy dealing with, with our, <laughs> seriously, to, to sit down and read your books with, to, to, to but no more excuses no more excuses yeah <laughs> thank you very very much thank you Yes, thank you very much. And that was wonderful. So, um, and, and in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and transition into our uh, final invited uh, presentation speaker for the day. And Leslie is going to do a brief introduction. Um, go ahead, Leslie. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Dr. Hyland. And I just wanted to, to give a brief shout out to Melissa. Uh, who worked so hard to organize this beautiful conference today. And, and as you notice, she has built conceptually 
from kind of like um, organizing in a universal design kind of way, like the backwards design, what we need to learn in order to conclude with our next speaker. And I love what, um, what Sensi just said about you know, bringing professional development to a wider audience. That's why the government uh, gives us huge amounts of money for Title III development in every district. So when we look at, at Dr. Hyland, when we look at um, Dr. De Oliveira, when we look at Keith Falsey, when we look at Deb, we need to think about what kind of package you want to provide for your teachers and your students in your district and kind of in a way shop for the information and the person who's going to connect the best to your teachers and administrators in your district. So when we created this theme for the, the, this conference, we were thinking of you in mind because we know that there is a paucity of professional development in the schools. And we know that writing is usually the biggest issue. We, we, we attended presentations from Big TESOL and we listened to the presenters there. We, we learned so much from uh, our past uh, TESOL president, Dr. Luciana de Oliveira, and we said, this is critical information that needs to get back to the schools. And the whole board was just so adamant and so passionate about bringing Dr. Falsey and Deb Alsey and Dr. Hyland to you so that you could get a broad overview and a deeper understanding of ideas that have been kind of nagging at you over the last few decades. So to bring this information, this pedagogical information to the surface so that you could articulate in your own words what is needed in your schools to get your content area teachers collaborating and understanding the deeper needs of your multilingual students. And this information benefits all of our students, right? It's not just the multilingual learners that benefit from this. When you broaden your, deepen your, your, uh, your wealth of information about teaching writing, uh, it's, it makes the invisible visible for all of your students because all of our students in some way or another need to make their learning uh, more visible and more explicit. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, my colleague and yours, Dr. Luciana de Oliveira, past president of TESOL, with whom I had the honor of presenting on a panel many years ago on teaching writing to the young kids. And um, this keynote um, presents a genre-based approach to writing for multilingual learners. This approach is a way to implement a functional approach to language development. You have to ask yourself, what's a functional approach? She's gonna tell you. Um, and so what she will do is embed some of the big ideas of the WIDA, uh, 2020 English Language Development Standards Framework. And uh, Dr. Oliveira will explain to you what WIDA is. K-12 uh, teachers know about it. And uh, she's going to use examples from elementary classrooms and she will highlight an apprenticeship model, the teaching and learning cycle um, based on various phases of activity to show how teachers can assist our little multi uh, multilingual writers in the context of the classroom. And as you know, uh, Dr. Oliveira is famous. <laughs> She's Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Graduate Studies at the School of mm -hmm. Education and Professor at, in the Department of Teaching and Learning at the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, mm -hmm. Virginia. And her research focuses on issues related to teaching multilingual learners at the elementary and secondary levels. She has authored and edited over 27 books, has 200 publications in various outlets. And as I mentioned, she served in the presidential line of the TESOL International Association and was a member of the board of directors in 2016. She was the first Latina ever to serve as president of TESOL in 2018-19. I turn it over to you, Luciana. 
Thank you so much, Leslie. Thanks for the invitation to, to present today and to Melissa as well for uh, organizing everything. I'm glad I am the last presenter and uh, didn't come before Ken because as I mentioned, he gave a great introduction to what I'm going to be talking about today. So that's really wonderful. Uh, just a little bit more about me. Uh, my work is in K through 12, so elementary and secondary classrooms. Though what I'm presenting here today really is applicable across grade levels and different levels of uh, education. So if you teach adults or if you teach in an IEP context, or if you teach at the university level with uh, master's students, I'm, I'm hoping that it uh, could be applicable to your context. Um, I work a lot with teachers, so uh, some of what I'm presenting today draws on that work with teachers in classrooms. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see. Um, so the genre-based approach to 